Welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you're able to join us this morning. Um, just a quick introduction to this series, Coffee and Conversations, is a discussion series jointly organized by the Carsey School of Public Policy, the State of New Hampshire Bureau of Education and Training, and the New Hampshire Association of Certified Public Managers. Um, we're, we're, we're going on, uh, I believe, four years now running this series, and we're really excited to be back and, and doing it uh, in 2022. Uh, we've had uh, one session this year uh, thus far, and we're looking forward to a really uh, exciting uh, schedule for the, the spring and into the summer. Uh, so once again, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, my name is Dan Bromberg. I am the Director of Academic Programs for the Kersey School of Public Policy. Um, and I'm happy to be joined today uh, by Heather Shank. Um, so Heather is the City Planner for the City of Concord. Um, she manages the Planning Division. Uh, so she and she staffs several boards, including the Planning Board, the Heritage Commission, the Conserv Conservation Commission, Trans Transportation Policy Advisory Committee, and the Energy and Environment Advisory Committee. Um, in addition to its work on a wide range of projects pertaining to these bodies, the City of Concord Planning Division also works on updating the city's zoning ordinance and uh, development regulations. So a whole lot um, within Heather's portfolio and the work that she does. And, we're really excited to hear from Heather and learn about the work that she's doing, how she engages with the public on that work and, and a number of other um, you know, issues related to, to land use. Um, so with that said, what I'm gonna do is jump off screen and just so you know, on the bottom of your screen, there is both a Q&A and a chat. Um, you're welcome to post your questions in either one of those um, and we'll try to answer them throughout the talk. We'll save some time after the talk as well. Um, but Heather is open to answering questions as she goes along. So please feel free to jump in. Um, and with that said, I'm super, super happy to welcome Heather and turn the screen over to, to you, Heather. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you, Dan. Um, just one point of clarification first. I, I work with a staff of, of three other, and you know, I manage three other staff. So I'll, we all together, um, you know, staff various different bodies and entities. So it's, uh, they, they do a lion's share of a lot of the work around here. So it's me with, with a couple other folks. Um, thanks for having me, I'm Heather Shank. Uh, so today, I think the name of this discussion was um, how to uh, public participation, effective public participation. And I am gonna talk about that at the end, but I also just wanted to give some context about uh, land use planning. Um, what is land use planning? Uh, where did it come from? Why do we have it? Um, oftentimes people do not actually know what land use planning is. And so I like to give a little bit of background. Um, it's a vast field. There are many different types of planning, um, including uh, regional planning, comprehensive planning, um, economic development planning, um, all different, you know, transportation planning. There are lots of different types of, of planning out there and planners work for at all different levels of government and for private entities. Um, so today I'm gonna to actually talk about land use planning. Um, I'm going ahead and share my screen. Uh, and so the type of land use planning um, that urban planners, city planners tend to do, do, do does involve a, a a wide range of those topics that I just mentioned as well. Um, you know, we do economic development, land use. Um, land use specifically refers to what types of uses are allowed, where are they located, um, what do they look like, how are, what's the form of the built environment. Um, it pertains to transportation infrastructure, housing, recreation, um, preservation of natural resources. Uh, so that all is kind of wrapped up in there uh, and, and has grown out of land use planning. Um, is my screen, oops, everyone can see my screen? I think, I think yep, you're, you're fine. Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so urban planning um, arose in the United States out of the Industrial Revolution. So at that time, there was, uh, you know, factories were being created and there was this mix of housing factories uh, in urban areas. Um, and so as the Industrial Revolution got in, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s into, into full swing, a lot of issues became, became apparent that there was a need to deal with a lot of issues like public sanitation, um, you know, trash and sewage. There was all this infrastructure that was identified that needed to, to be present that, that wasn't previously. Um, so there was pollution concerns and there was concerns about the form of the environment and the amount and, and, and the experience and the in terms of the buildings that were out there. Um, people became concerned with just creating these sort of like, you know, dark, 
foreboding places that that weren't that didn't feel too friendly to be around. So things like the, the height of structures, the spacing of structures, the design of structures. Um, so it, it was in um, 1916 that New York actually was the very first city um, in the nation to adopt a zoning uh, a zoning ordinance, a zoning code for the whole city. Um, and so they started putting some of these things into effect. They, the idea was to separate the manufacturing uses from the residential uses and you know, increase like safety and uh, you know, make logical sense of where things were located. Um, and then at a national level in 1922 was when the, the federal government actually created a um, kind of a model and enabling statute uh, or a model statute that enabled all of the states and all, every, everywhere to adopt zoning codes. Um, so really from, from around that time is when this idea of zoning first came into effect. And again, the idea was for public health and safety and identifying needs that, that arose out of this industrial revolution. Um, <clears throat> so moving along through into the 50s, um, with the development of the highway system and the access to more remote spaces uh, was the development of, of single use zoning and in terms of housing. And so that's where we started getting this suburban sprawl. You can see this picture here is of you know, the, the highway giving access to, to areas that people couldn't normally, you know, couldn't reach before the development of the automobile and the proliferation of the highway system and automobiles. Um, so other issues arose out of that um, in terms of like land consumption, uh, you know, suburban sprawl, everything that we know about typical suburban sprawl in terms of, you know, you know not necessarily being as efficient with land use the way the urban environment was, um, you know, destruction of natural resources and habitat. And it sort of just went a little bit crazy there for, for a couple of decades. Um, it was a very, the, the environment became very vehicular oriented and, and we still have that today. That's why I say 1950s to present. Uh, single family zoning was also something that arose out of this, this time period, which is something today um, that we associate with a lot of different um, challenges in terms of equity uh, and access to um, amenities for, for a community across all demographics. So age, demographics, you know, uh, economic status, um, single family zoning was something that sort of created these like enclaves of of communities and, and sort of left the cities. White flight is, I think, the typical term. We've heard about that. Um, <clears throat> so planners, in trying to address all these issues with the, with the resources and efficiency of land and, and also just sort of a sense of um, isolation that came out of the vehicular use and, and the disconnection from a lot of the amenities that were in the urban environment, um, around the 1990s, maybe maybe late 80s, but really around the 90s is when uh, the new urbanist movement came about in planning. Um, so these are kind of like the three major movements in, in terms of planning, the development of it in the early 20th century, and then the, the transition into this single family or single use zoning and, and sprawl, and then kind of a return to the concept of the urban environment and how to make that better. Of course, Throughout this time, there's also been lots of developments in, uh, you know, at, during the 20s is when a lot of other regulatory agencies, um, you know, came about as well, or, or at least more regulation in terms of the EPA and um, pollutants and technological developments that mitigated some of those effects of the, of the industry and the pollution. So it's kind of a, it's a different environment today than it was back then. Um, we have lots of different technologies today, uh, which creates a different, a different um, you know, environment for for planning to take place. So in the, around in the 90s was a popular trend of trying to get people back into the cities. Um, I think, you know, the term, uh, uh, well, not a, not a happy term, but the um, gentrification of cities was something that started to occur. And so being aware of this, this process of gentrification, I think equity has always been an important part of us, of uh, figuring out how to return to the cities and how to balance some of the scales in terms of social and economic um, demographics in urban spaces um, and coordinating them with the, with the suburban spaces. Um, so a term that is used a lot is retrofitting suburbia. What, what that means is trying to create these more urban friendly, higher density um, uses of land that is more like a, a op opportunities for multifamily development, mixed use development. Um, the picture that you're seeing here is, is, is a kind of a classic uh, new urbanist 
um, graphic showing how to retrofit. It could be anything. It could be an urban streetscape where the buildings have lost their form and the buildings have been pushed back, or it could be a suburban um, commercial commercial corridor where you once had all these big box stores and now you're retrofitting it to put um, you know, mixed use urban and commercial development along the corridor and, and creating a more pedestrian friendly space. Um, this is kind of, I really like this picture because it's showing you know, the height of the buildings are like four stories, but you've clearly got some smaller two story buildings here with these types of residential entrances, which are indicating that this is actually housing here. Um, and it's, it's, it's showing a much more integrated inter interactive space. And uh, part of the logic of this type of development is that we're trying to um, improve the efficiency of land, have a higher efficiency of land, higher tax base really for cities as well, but also preserving the open space um, and this is something that I'm, I'm kind of proud to be in Concord because it's something that Concord has done really, really well. Um, they've really concentrated a lot of their development in what we call the urban growth boundary. Um, and then there's a lot of preserved land outside of it. Um, so this takes into account transportation, multimodal trans transportation, um, and, and aesthetics. So at various points, aesthetics have been less or more in, important in the design process. Um, but this is sort of about, it's less about trying to separate the uses to create like, okay, here's our housing, here's our industrial, here's our commercial, um, which is what the 1950s suburban model was. And it's more about um, allowing uses to co-mingle if, because they, they can these days, but there's, there's less of an impact from some of the other adverse uses that, that there used to be in the 20s or 30s, you know, up for the last hundred years, really. Um, <clears throat> so uh, every state, so, so it's at the state level that land use is authorized. Each state has its own system of land use and land codes. Um, in New Hampshire, it's called the Revised Statutes Annotated, that they're the RSAs. Uh, pretty much in most, in most states, how it works is you develop a master plan, then you develop a zoning ordinance, and then you develop development regulations, which in New Hampshire are called site plan and subdivision regulations. So um, this is where that public participation piece comes in. Uh, the concept of the public good uh, in public health and safety um, and in using community input um, to create the vision for the community. So the, that's what the master plan really is. The master plan is sort of the hugest opportunity for the public to participate in the development of their community. They let their, if the process is working correctly, they let their goals and their uh, be known and those get incorporated into a vision for the community. Um, you know, there's a lot of data, a lot of research that goes into a master plan. Um, they use census data, they, their studies, you know, that's where the hugest public outreach happens, but also the most amount of research. So we use the, when we do the Concord um, master plan, which we will be updating after we complete a, a current project we're working on with the code, um, we'll be using the 2020 census data, um, <clears throat> looking at housing, transportation, demographics. Each piece of the master plan um, is, is a pretty vast area that, that we look at. So we'll probably be doing a transportation um, master plan update, um, we've already done an open space master plan update, um, and each piece of these involves public outreach and getting input from the community. <clears throat> the master plan ultimately ends up being adopted by the planning board um, <clears throat> and written into the RSAs, it actually states the requirement that public input, public participation be part of the process. So it's not just something that planners know is a good idea, it's also actually in the uh, statute that we're required to get public input for this for this part of the process. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I apologize. So once you do have your master plan, you have that adopted. Um, in, in New Hampshire, it it's, uh, recommends to be adopted every five to 10 years. Uh, we're at like 12 years, I think now in Concord. So we definitely uh, need to get, to get to get on the update for the master plan. Um, but once you have that that is the basis for your zoning ordinance. So the zoning ordinance are the legal codes adopted to create the type of development that your community has told you that they want. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the master plan in a minute and all the different pieces that are, that are in it. Uh, but the zoning ordinance is actually a, a laws. They're adopted by your elected officials, which could be different depending on the community. Um, in Concord, we have the city council or you may have your board of selectmen. Um, and, the, and, and the zoning ordinance is legally enforceable. So it's not, it's not something you can just decide you don't want to do or or anyone can really the only the only 
the only body that can give you permission from to to not do something in the zoning ordinance is, is the zoning board of adjustment and that's pretty much the case in any community now what is in the zoning ordinance uh, and what you're allowed to give variances is what we call them for is is really different depending on your state so in some states there are certain things that you legally cannot even give a variance for um, in other states you can so uh, in land use is one of those things. In New Hampshire, you can actually give someone a variance to change the use that is allowed in their district. In some other states, you actually can't do that. Whatever the zoning or uh, whatever the zoning map says is, is just the law unless you actually change the zoning map. Um, so there are these differences depending on the community and the state that you live in. Um, so from the zoning ordinance is what is developed land use regulations. Um, those are the site plan and subdivision regulations, and those are really the purview of in, in Concord of my department. Um, they're adopted by the planning board. We review development plans for compliance with, with these regulations. Um, they're more detailed. They're related more to site development. So the zoning ordinance deals with the big picture. Where is everything located? How tall can it be? Where are things located on the site? Um, you know, what are your requirements for things like parking and, and where and how, how uh, the construction standards in your in your community are implemented. Um, and the site plan regulations are more usually more about uh, you know, site related things. And that's why we have uh, public hearings for all of our planning board projects. So the public hearing is another opportunity for the public to come and participate about development that's happening in their community. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of flexibility with the site plan regulations in terms of like the board can actually uh, give you waivers for certain things. If you're like, oh, I just, I really can't put this buffer. Well, usually buffers now they're in the ordinance, but if you're, if you, I really can't locate this thing here. Can we shift it over here? Or, you know, is it okay if we provide this instead of that? There's a lot more flexibility and that's where the public input is helpful for the board. You know, we notify the abutters for a project so that they can come and give their input on, on the project. But uh, the thing about the, the this is, Oftentimes people misunderstand this process. They think they think the board can say no or do whatever they want. If, if there's enough public outcry, um, they think that the board can just deny an application, which they can't uh, because of the zoning ordinance. So the zoning ordinance is, is um, rules the, um, the legality of the situation. So if something is allowed by the zoning ordinance, the board cannot simply say, oh, we don't like this we're not going to do that. Um, so the, the city could be you know, sued if, if they don't adhere to their own zoning ordinance. Um, so within, within the realm of the site plan and subdivision regulations, there can be changes, but the board does not have the ability. The, the public often, um, you know, they, sometimes they come and they're like, well, why are we even here if it doesn't, doesn't matter? But it does matter because they can say like, oh, I'm worried about the traffic and then the board, or I'm worried, not, I'm worried about the lights from the traffic and the angle or whatever. And then the board can say, oh, well, let's put a bunch of landscaping here or, or a fence or something like that. So they can help mitigate aspects of the site plan that might negatively impact their neighbors. Um, so that's kind of the structure in, in New Hampshire, and very similar to a lot of other communities, like I said, with slight differences of how land use codes get implemented and created. Um, at every step in this process, uh, the, there's an opportunity for public, for public input. So in adopting zoning ordinance, adopting the site plan regulations, there are public hearings and opportunities depending on what outreach methods you're using to, um, to get public feedback and input. Um, so the master plan, as I noted, is, is really the biggest opportunity to affect the, the future and the development of your community. Um, so there you're required in, the, in New Hampshire, if you're gonna do a master plan, you're required to have a vision section and you're required to have a land use section. So those are the two most important aspects of the, of the plan that have to be there um, you know, from a statutory perspective. Uh, and it also specifies that you have to have existing land use section and a future land use section. And again, based on population, economic activity, natural, historical, and cultural resources. And again, it does say that you, you're required to have public input. Um, then your plan, these are a bunch of different sections. It's kind of funny how um, New Hampshire does this. Other states don't necessarily do this, but they list all the things that you may put in there. Um, but 
but that doesn't necessarily mean if you add a section that's not on this list that you're, you're there's something wrong with your master plan but they do specifically list all of these things that you may include in your master plan um i tried highlighting the sections that concord has but then i realized we have most of them uh, they're not all in the actual master plan but for instance um there's a natural hazards master plan uh, that we get facilitation from the regional planning agency to create um, there is a, a public an infrastructure water and sewer master plan um, that another division creates. Uh, so we obviously don't need a coastal management plan, um, but we do have other, we have lots of master plans. We have other neighborhood plans, um, which this is not in our specific master plan, but we do have a lot of neighbor neighborhood plans as well. Um, so the thing about master plans is just because you put it in that document, it does not give it um, a legal authority. In other words, if your master plan says, um, you know, this street should be, you know, have a lot of trees on it. You can't, you can't, uh, this, this, this neighborhood or community should focus on or, or is for, or is for preservation. Um, you can't take that language and then base an argument for making um, legal decisions about development from the master plan, unless your zoning ordinance actually refers to the master plan. So we do actually have a section in our zoning ordinance that says this shall comply with this section of the master plan. So that little line in the zoning ordinance actually gives the master plan a, a regulatory authority, that section of the master plan. Um, so it's kind of interesting the way the master plan works. These are supposed to be visions and goals, but sometimes depending on the plan, they may have some more specific information. And uh, you remember the zoning ordinance is the legal document. So if the zoning ordinance refers to something, it, it gives that document, that legal authority for enforcement. Um, so uh, this is my last slide. I've just been sort of trying to give you all the context. So um, please feel free to ask me questions about anything, um, but, on the public participation piece. So, so in getting feedback in, in all these different sections, um, there, there's a lot of different tools. Public participation is a, is a huge realm of, of, um, of really of, of work, I guess. You know, there are professionals out there that this is all that they do. Um, it's, it's a big part and an important part of planning. Uh, and not everybody knows how to do this or, or can do it well. Um, sometimes there may be a requirement for a project at a federal level and they'll say, oh, we're required to have public participation. So they'll have like one meeting and maybe it's advertised, maybe it's not, but all they have to do is really check that box and say, well, we had this meeting and this was the opportunity for people to give their input. Um, but, but for planners, equity and representation are really important. Um, and oftentimes the people that we want to reach everyone, we want to reach all the demographics, all the aspects of the community. Um, some planners, sometimes during these processes, they'll go to schools and they'll do um, charrettes with school, with school kids or surveys or, you know, have discussions with kids and say, what do you guys want to see in your community? Um, so public participation is, is very time consuming. Um, it's very expensive. And there are lots of different ways to do it. Um, so just some of these tools that we that I have listed here uh, are workshops and charrettes. So you can schedule things, which is what I tend to do. I tend to put out advertisements when something's going to happen, and I try to get the word out in as many different social media venues as possible um, and notify people. Um, these can be in person or they can be online. Um, so before COVID, we most of all of this stuff was really done in person. Um, since COVID, uh, we've utilized you know private firms and cities have really had to um, figure out how to utilize technology and online platforms to do this type of stuff. Uh, we used online platforms for our planning board meetings when we were trying to you know, socially distance, um, city council meetings, and our various boards and commissions, we were using uh, online platforms to have meetings. And I, I think we found, I, I personally have found them to be really effective. People feel comfortable showing up online. They feel comfortable participating online. Um, you know, others feel that that in-person, um, that in-person contact just, you know, can't be replaced and it's, and it's not the same if you're not there in person. Um, so there's kind of a conversation happening right now at the, at the state level, all of those formal bodies, like the council and the planning board, they're, they're required to be in person. That's just how the state statute is set up. Um, so, but it is an ongoing sort of discussion among like planners and the and planning community about which which is 
you know, should we, which one should we do? Which one works better? What are the benefits of, of either? Um, so we're sticking with online as much as possible these days uh, because of COVID and also just because of the, the ways that it's provided greater access to people who may not be able to be somewhere in person, either they're too far away or they have maybe mobility issues or anxiety issues, you know, whatever it is. Um, so visioning sessions are the same way. You can do those in person, you can do those online. Um, surveys are, are can be really valuable and fun because they're pretty easy and uh, you know, people tend to like to do surveys. Um, so you can do those online or in person. You just send them out if you have, if you have a good contact list, that's really key for, um, for getting online, uh, online platforms to be effective. Um, so uh, public out, uh, outreach in terms of advertisement and social media and using the newspaper and all the venues that you can to get the word out so that people will contact you and maybe join the mailing list or or join the newsletter or something like that so that you can send blasts out to them when events are happening um, is a really effective way. Um, so seeking people out in their own environment. So a lot of people will do uh, a lot of, um, you know, what I've seen happen, let me put it that way, um, they'll go out into maybe the church and they'll do a, a meeting with a church group or, or they'll, the church will host them and they'll say, oh, tonight we're having this blah, blah, blah session. And so it, it, it leaves, it, it accesses the church members or community centers, um, as I said, or schools. So uh, seeking people out in their own environment can be a really effective way to get feedback um, to groups that don't normally participate in these processes. Uh, now, these days, more and more, providing compensation to participate is actually something that's done. Um, you know, this is something that uh, allows parents who are overworked or overwhelmed or don't have childcare um, to participate in the process. So you actually provide childcare for them um, and you, and you offer payment for groups that, you know, that, uh, that were that, where that would be an incentive for them to participate. Uh, it doesn't have to be a lot, but like 50 bucks or something like that um, is something that is done. Um, so as I was mentioning, using technology in general, uh, but so I've been to a charrettes where, or I've been to uh, workshops and visioning sessions where they'll have a, um, They'll, they'll periodically run a survey on a big screen and the, you have clickers. And so the survey will say, uh, you know, what is your most important thing? You know, what is your most important value? And people will use their clickers and you can see in real time what the results of the survey are. Those are, those are really fun and they're easy to do. And they do get some really interesting data, especially if you have a big group there. I was at one that had like a, at least a hundred people. Um, and it was really interesting. Each question, you can see the results. Uh, of course, you can also do this these days with cell phones. I've heard, I've never participated in that. Um, not everyone has that available to them. So uh, like my dad, he does not have a smartphone. <laughs> so he would not be able to participate in a session where you're expected to use your phone. Um, visual preference surveys, I really like a lot. That's, that's where you show people, you could have this, you could have that, you could have this. Which do you like better? Um, it's really helpful because it's an educational tool as well as a public feedback tool. So it's showing people um, things they may never have thought of or never seen before and allowing them to say what they like best. And that helps that helps your community. To, and sometimes it's surprising. Sometimes you think, oh, well, I, you know, people didn't, I thought everyone would love this, but they all love that. Um, so that can be a really helpful tool as well. Um, Pop-up events and, and piggybacking on other events are similar. Um, so for instance, you might go, like I go to the YMCA every day, a lot of people do at the end of the day, you know, you might have a little kiosk outside the YMCA to say, hey, uh, you know, we wanna get your public feedback on this issue or at the grocery store. There are a lot of different venues where they'll have these little pop-up um, opportunities. And usually when you have those, you'll have like a, a map or, you know, a questionnaire or something to get feedback from people. Um, those are especially effective when you're, when you are piggybacking on other events. Like if there's a, a, you know, a street festival or a fair or something like that, um, where you have your own little booth and you can get information from people that way. Um, as you may have gathered, these are, um, these can be really intensive, um, you know, financially and time consuming uh, uh, tools to use for public participation. So it can be uh, oftentimes when a municipality does stuff like this, they either have a ton of staff or they hire consultants um, to really re get people's feedback and is, is, it can be a real challenge and it takes a lot of thought. Um, so some of the strategies for uh, using these tools 
so I, when I was in school, I actually took a bunch of courses in public participation, which were really invaluable because there's some really simple and basic things that you may not think of that are so effective. Uh, like writing is so, if you have a public meeting and you have a big pad, you just write everything down, every single thing that people say, write it down um, because then they feel like, oh, I participated, I contributed, there's the thing that I said. And it's true, it's there. You know, we evaluate and we collate these things and we use that information. But for people to see what they, you know, what they contributed um, on a piece of paper helps people feel like they have, uh, you know, like their time has been valuable and that they participated and there was a reason for being there, which is a big part of, you know, how you encourage people to keep participating and coming back. Um, so the number one rule though, listen to what people say, you know, repeat what they say to make sure you understand it or to make them feel that you understand it and then respond if you can or if you need to um, or if they're asking you to. Um, but never, never, never argue. So the public participation is not a, a venue to, um, you know, to con convince anyone of anything or to like explain to them why what they're saying doesn't make any sense. You know, it's just not the, it's not, that's not what it's for. And it's never, never helpful. You just, you don't want to create conflict in these events. You want people to feel like their, their participation is being valued. Um, so if people don't participate, you want to have questions like to, to stimulate the conversation. And sometimes it's helpful to hand out little slips of paper. Um, so for the most part, as you may notice, what I'm talking about strategies for engagement are for actual in-person sessions. Um, so if you're having one of these actual in-person sessions, uh, you know, you, you want to have materials, you want to have things for people to write with or write on or little, little slips where if, if you're boring the hell out of them, they can write down a bunch of stuff on a, you know, you, they have three questions. Oh, I'm just gonna answer these questions. <laughs> and that's helpful too. Um, so providing alternatives is, is, you know, playing off of that visual preference survey thing. So if you're having a visioning session and you're saying, what do you think is important about your community? What is, what do you, what, what encapsulates Concord or, or whatever? What, what, what do you, what are you, what is your vision for the community? That's really open-ended. And a lot of people may just be like sitting there sort of like, uh, uh, I don't know. So it, it's helpful to have a variety of answers for people because then they can choose from and they can say, oh, this and this, you know, so it stimulates them it gives them something to, to contribute, but then it stimulates them to actually, um, you know, go off on their own and contribute more. Um, uh, so some other, I'm sorry, I'm talk, probably talking really fast, but some other basics, always have a sign-in sheet. Always, every chance you get, you can get to get people to sign up for an email or a newsletter um, so that you have contacts. And those contacts can be used for follow-up to say, okay, this is what came out of the participation session that you participated in, or, hey, we're on the next step, or, you know, come and do the next thing that we have. And in that way, you can have follow-through with the public. Um, they can see the results of what came out of the session that you, you were with, but then they can also continue to contribute and, you know, be aware of opportunities moving on into the future. Um, so uh, one thing that's not on my list, but that is, really important is timing. And that's the most, it's oftentimes the most difficult piece of it is at what point in a process do you get the public feedback? Um, and that is no easy feat to answer that question. So, uh, you know, you may feel that you, you wanna do more than you're able to do, which is I think often the case. Um, but I think in the very beginning, definitely in the very beginning, you want people to know what's going on. And then throughout a process, you know, follow up with them, even in little ways, if you can. Um, and then finally, if you are in person, have food. <laughs> People love snacks. So whether it's a drink or, or um, you know, I often try to get like a cracker tray or something like that if I'm having like a big charrette that it, that's in person. Um, but, you know, as so we have our coffee and conversation here, which is helpful because food uh, and drinks and things like that allow people to sort of relax and and mingle and and participate um so this was a lot of information is there uh i'm sort of at the end of my slide um i i threw in this i threw in this little uh graphic here just to kind of highlight to me what's important about public participation um, is equity. Equity and representation are a big part of what makes participation valuable. Um, when you're getting participation from 
um, you know, the regular people that always participate, but also when you're getting feedback from aspects of your community that maybe wouldn't normally participate, so that your vision that you come up with is really representing everyone. Um, the, the process is to generate ideas, and it's also to generate support for the ideas, because the more people that you have involved than what you come up with, you're going to have a lot of public support, hopefully for the final product, because that's, you know, they'll feel ownership of it. Um, so generating ideas, uh, ed also educating people. So when you go through one of these processes, you know, people may not be aware of what the current trends are in a field or what the possibilities are uh, or what they can or should expect out of development in their community. So, you know, telling them, hey, this is what you could, this, these are some streetscapes or these are some um, types of recreational corridors or, or whatever that exist in other places, you know, show them these examples. And then they say, oh yeah, we want our community to, you know, focus their funds on developing something like this as well. Um, so it, that's how it helps to create a vision and a future and represent the community in the best way possible. Um, I, I can take questions, Dan, if you have questions. Um, I wanted to sort of end with uh, letting you guys know what's going on in, in, uh, in Concord right now. So we're working on a um, we're working on a, um, revising the zoning code and we've just about finished with phase one and that will be made public from our website, um, which is down located down here. Um, but we're actually kicking off the phase two process of the of developing the zoning code. Um, so we're at that, we, we're not doing the master plan, we're at the zoning code phase and we're rewriting the zoning ordinance and uh, we did it in two phases. And so we're kicking off phase two um, which is going to focus on new development. A lot of what I've been talking about here, um, showing alternatives and getting people's feedback for how they want um, different areas of their community to redevelop if they want new or different ideas um, relating to like commercial corridor development, um, high density residential development. Um, so we have some industrial areas of the city that could use some visioning and feedback from the community and how they want those to develop. Um, and we'll be looking um, really at two geographic areas. We'll be targeting basically two geographic areas, but the 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 charrettes and the visioning will involve all different aspects. You know, all you know, like both se all sessions will deal, for instance, with um, you know talking about uh, like the mall and commercial that type of commercial big box development. Um, but we'll be focusing. We'll be targeting really the Penica community for one session and then the Heights community in another session. Those are sort of the central uh, focal areas for where we need to do the most visioning um, for this process, for the code process. Um, so I just threw up some dates and times there. Um, and our consultants that we have from Austin, Texas will be on the call to do some of what I've been talking about. They'll be showing some um, visual preference surveys. They'll be talking about other types of development. Um, they'll be, you know, showing people the areas that we're looking at and getting feedback. And, you know, we will probably end up uh, just providing, uh, um, we'll, we'll get feedback during the meeting, but we'll probably end up giving people, you know, contacts or a place to go so that they can provide additional feedback because these that's one of the drawbacks of the online forum is, is getting feedback from people um, can be a challenge. So Dan, did you have, wow, did I really talk for an hour? No, we're, we're good. Um, <laughs> we're, we're about a, a half hour, a little more than a half hour in. Um, so um, a, a couple questions are coming in and I'll kind of just kick us off on this topic and then um, I'll jump to the chat. So if anyone else wants to throw questions into the chat or the Q&A, please, please go ahead and do so. Um, so as far as participation goes, um, what does that look like, I guess, on the ground? Are you seeing people, you know, jumping onto these online forums? Are you seeing people coming out? I mean, maybe not, you know, these days due to COVID. Um, you know, are you getting solid participation? Where do you see people kind of engaging the most, I guess, is, is really the question. Yeah, um, I think people, as I said, people do seem to feel comfortable getting online. Um, I haven't done too much of it yet because the, the upcoming meetings in a few weeks are the first sort of opportunity that that I'll have to engage with the with the online format for these types of visioning and share at work workshops. From my colleagues, I've heard that they are very effective, that they do tend to attract people for, this, for the reasons that I said, the accessibility and just the ease of doing it. Um, and, uh, and people feel comfortable participating in that way. Um, I've, I feel that it's been uh, easier with our planning board meetings when we were on Zoom. Um, 
you know, once you get the hang of how to run an online meeting and, and juggle all the participants, uh, people, you know, they click that little button, their the hands up button, and then you, you see these are the people that want to talk. Um, and I, I've just found it to be really effective. You know, it's always a challenge when people are not familiar with the technology and maybe don't know how to use it or what to do. But, you know, just keep calm and keep patient and, and uh, you know, help them. And you have to have alternatives. So like we, when we were doing our public meetings, we always had a staff available so people could call and say, I'm trying to get online and I'm having trouble. Um, so that's what we did for the planning board meetings. Um, so I'll, I'll let you know, three weeks, uh, and we're, we're having these um, sessions and we'll see, you know, it, it, the biggest, the biggest um, challenge is just getting the word out and getting people to show up for the meeting. And, and uh, you know, I'm hoping that it is going to be effective. I've heard that it has been effective for other communities. Awesome. Um, so we have a question here from, from Pete, um, and I believe the second part of it is a follow-up. So I'll read them both. Um, could you please comment on the issues of veteran housing, multifamily workforce housing, and kind of the, the lack of this type of housing in communities? Um, and then Pete follows up if you're familiar with the builder with Boulder Point in Plymouth. Um, so I guess mm -hmm. we'll kind of tackle that first one and then we can get to the, yeah. the Boulder Point. So housing, uh, I'm not familiar with with that um, with Boulder Point, but housing is right now one of the biggest issues that that we're dealing with because we have just really um, intense needs for housing of all types, uh, veteran housing, age restricted housing, um, low income housing affordable in market rate. So, um, and, and it, it, part of the challenge is just the, the, the industry right now and how expensive development is for everyone. Um, I, in Concord, we've done a lot of things to make it to, to incentivize, I would say, uh, you know, financially, like we've gotten rid of some um, investment fees in districts uh, to reduce the cost for the developers. Um, you know, we, we've always been very supportive of all types of housing. And, you know, if, if, you know, for instance, you know, reducing certain, we've reduced a lot of fees. We haven't raised our application fees in like, since I've been here for the planning board process. Um, so we, we do try to assist all types of housing. Um, we haven't, uh, you know, we've had a few members of the community ask about uh, giving like density incentives for affordable housing or different types of housing. And, and there, we haven't done that because, uh, nobody's tried to max out their density really in most locations. Um, it's, it's really, it's been really rare for people to max out. Like we want them to do that. We want them to max out their density, but they, they haven't, they, they're not in most, in many cases, they're not even maxing out what they are able to get. Um, Could you just and, explain quickly what that, what you mean by that, by the, the density incentives and maxing out density? Well, sure. So you, you, for instance, in, in some of our, um, you know, residential areas, or actually not residential areas, but some of our downtown areas, uh, you know, you could, you might be able to do, um, you know, certain, say, say you're allowed to do, you know, 70 units, and you only want to do 55, you know, so what, how is providing a density incentive going to make you do anything more than what you wanted to do? Um, and that's often the case, and it, it's less the case, it's actually less the case now, because uh, of, of more and more developers are coming forward trying to do um, residential housing, but for the for the projects that we've had come through that have been constructed, they have not maxed out the density that they're allowed on their site. Um, and and furthermore, my, my second point is a lot of those projects have been affordable housing. So we we've actually gotten more um, affordable housing projects constructed than any other type of housing in the last few years. And so our the struggle our struggle in Concord, I think, has really been getting market rate projects to go to go through to go. To get constructed. Um, so every community is different. I think other communities do struggle with affordable housing more, um, and, but I, I feel like in Concord, we've been really supportive of, um, of all types of housing. If you have somebody that wants to do like a veterans housing you were, you were talking about, you know, we do have like two or three organizations in Concord that focus on, um, you know, providing housing to various groups. And, you know, we just, we assist them wherever we can. And, and that includes like trying to rush something uh, you know, trying to make sure we get all the reviews done in time because they have a deadline, you know, so we're, we're in Concord, we're very, um, we're very cooperative and trying to get help get people's housing projects constructed. A big part of the code that we're proposing um, is all about allowing more units 
on property, giving property owners more ability to provide units, whether they're affordable or, or whatever, um, to provide accessory dwelling units. You know, it's more, it, uh, we're, the first phase was really focused more on allowing development of incre uh, incremental development of density um, and allowing the community to, uh, you know, community members and property owners to add units to their existing structures or to, you know, put accessory dwelling units on their property. Uh, uh, almost everything that we've done for the past few years working on this code has been about making housing easier, um, including reducing parking requirements. Um, so we do know it's a big deal and we've really struggled. Well, we worked hard to, to address some of those issues. Excellent, thanks. Um, going back to something you had said earlier in the presentation, you had mentioned um, the idea of balancing, you know, preservation and growth. Um, uh, and I think you called it uh, preservation, preservation art and, and um, the growth boundary. Is that, uh, I think that's what you had said. But um, so could you talk about that balance and how that plays out in Concord? And, you know, so what does that look like on the ground um, as far as that balance goes? Yeah, we have an urban growth boundary in Concord and it's primarily based on infrastructure, um, municipal infrastructure provision. So, and again, this is all based on master planning. So there are master plans that talk about you know, projections of population and where they should be and where they, where, where we can, you know, reach them. And then they created like, we have a storm, well, we have a municipal utilities infrastructure master plan. Um, and that, you know, the planning for that used the growth boundary, but the growth boundary is also created from that planning. Um, so it's really about what the capacity is for our, like our sewer capacity and our water capacity. Um, and the existing infrastructure that we have in place. So the urban growth boundary is about, you know, where can we extend sewer to? Where do we want to extend sewer to? Where, you know, water and sewer both. That's really the foundational piece of the boundary of the urban growth boundary. So in terms of zoning, um, what we've done is in those areas where we've said, if you can extend, you know, here's your urban growth boundary, if you can extend water or sewer, it, 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 and it doesn't encompass the existing infrastructure, it encompasses the capacity that was built into those master plans. So there are areas within the urban growth boundary where infrastructure is not extended to, um, but in, in, in where that ex infrastructure does not exist, you're not allowed as high density in those areas because you have to, you know, you can go by DES and what you're allowed to put for, um, you know, uh, septic systems on the property and what the soils and what the land is like. Um, but if you want to extend that infrastructure, you're allowed a higher density. You're governed by different rules if you have that infrastructure. Um, so uh, everything outside of that boundary is is really what we call the uh, residential open space district, where it's it's lower density. There's a lot of conservation. Well, actually, there's a lot of conservation land throughout the city of Concord, um, but a lot of it is in that in that district that's outside the boundary. Um, this was something that planning staff has done for, you know, for just decades, ever since planning started in Concord, and they've just done such a good job. Like, I love this community. <laughs> they've done, they've done such a good job at keeping the density in the core. I think it's something like 18 square miles that has like 70 to 80% of the population of the city, which is just phenomenal. I mean, it's, it's really, really great. And, you know, we, we struggle with the sort of the, the outskirts of it in terms of, you know, people want to do single family housing, right? But, which is fine. I mean, there's a ton of single family housing, um, but actually a lot of Concord is zoned for multifamily housing. And again, people just aren't taking advantage of that where they could put two or three units in their house. Now there's a ton of single family homes. So um, it, it has been set up for decades to allow an incremental increase in density where a population exists for the purpose of preserving that open space but also it's cheaper for the community because that's where we have the infrastructure. You know, that's where we have, that's close to, you know, fire service and, and water and, you know, all police, you know, like we have a huge, Concord is 64 square miles. Um, and we've got like, you know, police officers who are, you know, they're just covering these vast areas. So, you know, trying to keep most of the people close together allows, you know, allows them to, um, you know, be more effective in, providing the services that they provide too. So um, all of that stuff, that, that, that all that stuff goes into where the urban growth boundary is and, and why it is where it is. Yeah, awesome, um, re really, really helpful. So it sounds like, you know, 70% of the population lives within, you know, less than a third of, of the yeah. uh, geographic area. Um, yeah. You're really helpful. Um, kind of a, a bigger picture question, um, 
you know, we're seeing a lot of growth. I mean, we've seen a lot of growth, right? Where uh, you could think about, you know, from Boston up to kind of natural Concord Manchester corridor, you know, if we were to go further south into other metropolitan areas where, um, you know, New York City to Philadelphia feels like it's getting, you know, closer these days than it ever has been. So could you talk about kind of growth outside of your community? So outside of Concord and, and how does that affect you, um, you know, as a planner within a city? Are, are you talking to other planners? Are you guys trying to figure out how do we, you know, connect and, and solve some of these problems that, that go beyond boundaries of a, you know, a town or a city? Sure. Yeah, and um, that's a great question. And I, I think Concord is, is interesting in regards to like, we're more similar to Nashua or Manchester or Boston or New York, like cities all have a lot in common. Um, but New Hampshire is, you know, we have a lot of cities in New Hampshire, but then we have like most of New Hampshire is smaller towns and very low density and dispersed kind of, um, you know, population. So a lot of communities have have different, you know, for Concord, we can say, oh, easy, here's our urban growth boundary, because we already have this infrastructure. But a lot of those other communities don't have that infrastructure. And so it's, it's much harder for them to understand how to provide housing. So this conversation I'm having right now is really primarily focused towards housing and infrastructure and the needs for housing. And there's transportation needs as well. Um, so I, I think that, you know, to some degree, we're lucky here that we have the infrastructure that we do. We don't have some of those questions on the outskirts. Um, what this is kind of leading me to is the way that um, the state statutes are updated. Um, so we have New Hampshire Housing Authority and uh, you know other folks who are trying to solve the housing crisis in New Hampshire. And the way they're doing that is, is sort of trying to influence the, the you know, the laws. So saying, for, for like most recently, one of the most recent laws that they past a few years ago was that any any community that allows a um, single family home or any district that allows a single family home is also required to allow an accessory dwelling unit. So we're seeing this kind of like state level, you know, and that's to encourage communities that may be, um, you know, reticent for density or they, they don't want density or they may be, you know, exclusionary. Um, so there's this like attempt at the state level to overcome resistance to, to housing by regulating at the state level, which is awesome if, <laughs> yeah, on a statewide level, but it's been a challenge for us in Concord because we've actually been working on a code for a couple of years now that addresses all these issues in a different way. And so it's created obstacles for us to, um, you know, well, we've had to work through it. Let me put it that way. We've had to work through some of the legal issues because of the, and they're doing, they're doing it now as well. I think there's some, um, bills right now um, out there about requiring certain amounts of uh, uh, requiring communities to allow certain amounts of, of density and housing um, based on the infrastructure that they have. So, uh, you know, they're trying to solve problems, but they're also, you know, creating this like one way that it's done, which, you know, may not be the best way, or it, it may not be written in a very sensitive way. The other piece to that, which is um, maybe more related to your question is, is transportation planning. Um, so we've been working on the Merrimack River Greenway Trail in Concord, which is supposed to connect, you know, ultimately to these other communities and be sort of like a regional trail network. So I think recreation and open space are one of those ways that, that uh, you know, planning uh, at a regional level is really effective. And, you know, the regional planning agencies do tend to be involved with that stuff. We have, uh, I think, six regional planning agencies in New Hampshire um, and that, that, you know, we have like central... Southeast, you know, the West, we've got them, we've got a bunch of different regional planning agencies. So coordinating with the planning agencies can be a really, um, you know, effective way to get some of the, and to help get funding as well to do some of these things. Um, but um, I'm sorry, am I, am I then veering no, from your that, question? That, that, Is that no, sort of related great. to what you were looking for? I think it's super helpful. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of leave it with one, one kind of, you know, final kind of bigger, bigger picture question that I'm just, you know, curious your, your take on. Um, so obviously, you know, with master planning and with planning, you're thinking out kind of long range, you're thinking about, you know, what's to come and how are we going to address this, what a population growth look like, et cetera, or uh, decrease potentially. Um, so kind of looking out, you know, you're 5, 10, you know, 15, 15 years out, um, what are you looking at as far as challenges that either, you know, the city of Concord is going to be facing, the state might be facing, um, you know, what's, what's out there that, that you're paying attention to? Well, I think 
I think now is just a very uncertain time. It's very hard to answer that question because of the speed of technology. Like often we go to conferences and we talk about um, driverless vehicles and the conversations about, you know, vehicle technology and automated vehicles, um, you know, really changes the conversation about transportation planning. And, you know, for instance, right now in, in New Hampshire, we're looking at, and in Concord in particular, you know, the 93, the 93 expansion through the city. And so, you know, I go to these meetings and I ask the consultants, what about driverless vehicles? Because the, the quote unquote problem that they're trying to solve is congestion. And in 10 years, is that, is that you know, what's the speed of the technology? Or, or, or is everyone gonna be driving driverless vehicles in 20 years? And they'll be like, why do we have this huge highway? You know, so it's difficult to know. Um, also, you know, energy, like we're trying to, you know, it, it's a big issue. A lot, a lot of times we get very um, proactive people saying like, oh, we want to do solar, we want to do solar, you know, especially in Concord, we went through this whole thing with solar. And it's like, what's well, really, it's almost, it's, it's the market, you know, it's where do they want to be? How, how are they going to do it? Um, you know, there was this perception that, that people couldn't do it. And we we're like, no, you can do it now and you can do it. We're making it easier for you to do it here. It's easier now. There's still been no solar projects in Concord. So, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to incorporate all these new technologies into understanding like parking, you know? So um, I've been an advocate for reducing parking requirements um, because people are having less cars. And, you know, and then you look at like, well, if we do have these driverless vehicles, do we really need, you know, are, are people gonna get out of their car and send it back home? It's like, do we need all this parking here? You know, so parking, I think is a big piece of, of planning because parking garages are expensive. And parking garages are really the only solution to how to increase density without creating seas of parking. And it's just, it's a difficult, it's a, it's difficult to commit to as a community because of, you know, there's this perception there's never enough parking. Um, so I think really the, the vehicle technology and transportation technology um, for me is a big piece of like, how does land use change in the future? Because, you know, if you have, uh, you know, if you, if we had, for instance, like I look at Concord and I think it's amazing. It's like, it's eight miles basically from, you know, the, the, to the bottom to the top, which to me is a very bikeable, you know, uh, a, a distance. Like, I feel like I could, if we had the transportation infrastructure, like bicycle infrastructure, like, like they have in Europe, for instance, um, you know, people could literally be biking everywhere and no, in any weather, really, if, it, if we were prioritizing, you know, maintenance of that infrastructure. So I think that, you know, for me, I, I look towards the technology and the transportation and how that that's just a massive impact in how our community is developed and where people live and how they live. Um, so, you know, telecommuting is going to change, it's changing the face of communities and, uh, you know, where people are located, what jobs they have. So it's really kind of a topsy-turvy time right now and we're just having to keep the stuff in our minds and just keep asking the question you know it, how how obsolete is this going to be you know in 15 years which doesn't seem which seems like a long time but it's really not <laughs> yeah it's great I, I mean and you think about the you know the growth of the transportation system in this country and how you know development shifted around that transportation um you know the corridors interstate highway systems um, et cetera, and, and how we've seen, you know, different systems built up in, in Europe and in Asia that um, drive, you know, different types of growth. Um, so yeah, re really interesting stuff. Um, so thank you, Heather. We really appreciate your time this morning. Um, we're hitting 9.15, so I wanna just uh, keep everyone's time in mind. Um, we appreciate everyone uh, joining us today. Um, we'll encourage you to, to keep showing up on, on uh, our uh, second Wednesday of, of the month, um, next, Wednesday, uh, next month, April 13th. Um, we have Charles Sayo with us, who Charles is the Executive Director of the Governor's Commission on Disability. Um, so it should be a really interesting conversation. Um, so we encourage everyone to uh, you know, join us there. You can register on our website. Um, so once again, thank you so much, Heather, for spending some time with us this morning. Really interesting thanks for, stuff. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, our pleasure. And uh, thanks to everyone else who uh, logged in. Take care, everyone.